there, or turn, turn on. And uh, people always ask, what's the screen foster mean? Let me just get out of the way, okay? <clears throat> but behind the name, uh, it's really uh, the idea of bringing life to legacy, okay? And uh, we are passionate about building great products that make lives easier. Um, actually, so, so we work in the industry for a long time. You look at all of us, you can tell we work <laughs> for a long time. And um, uh, we have, among which we work for a number of MNCs. And the last two MNCs, IBM and Sun Microsystems. Okay, so we do have a natural affinity for Java, right? So after all, Sun Microsystems brought Java to the world, right? Anybody remember Sun? Okay, good. <laughs> okay, so um, so Java is good, and we kind of like happy with it, and uh, but we have kind of like have transitioned over to Scala. And then we hope to take this, we thought it would be interesting to share with the community, here our story, uh, the reason why and how we transited from Java to Scala, okay? So this is not gonna be a so-called a discourse on why Scala versus why Java. No religious this debate, like those days, old days we used to do, when some microsystems we used to do evangelism or Java versus .NET. Okay, so we don't do that here. So it's just a sharing of our, purely our personal experience, and hopefully there'll be some takeaway if you, you have some decisions to make. Hopefully it can help you. So um, what do we do? Is this the one, correct? Yeah, what do we do? Uh, we are a full stack web development team, right? Uh, the team is here, actually my team is here. If you want to just raise your hands, okay, the team is here. Uh, by full stack, we mean also uh, managing the infrastructure so that we can give an end-to-end -end service to our customers, all right? Uh, we <clears throat> actually, we started off calling ourselves uh, social technopreneurs. I don't know whether you heard of the term, okay, social technopreneurs, uh, but anyway, uh, we, we, we rely heavily on open source, all right? So open source is important because uh, we want to stand on the shoulder of giants, all right? And, but at the same time, we also find that open source is not everything. You, we are able to find a lot of things, good stuff, but sometimes we can't find what we need. Then we find that we have to build our own IP. We've got to build the stuff that is not there. Or the stuff that's there that works, but not exactly to what we need, and hence we need to build it. So we were talking just now about replacing Tor, for example. We're replacing Tor with our own templating um, engine. So we build things when we need it, right? So we don't shy away from that. Um, and so we're in the business of providing end-to-end -end service. Um, <clears throat> so Java has served us well. Java is really good. In fact, we used it uh, for, uh, for seven years. Um, it's a great community, mature products, mature libraries, good tooling. Um, in fact, we consider ourselves quite proficient Java developers, all right, because we'll do some of the more advanced things like um, like reflections, uh, we create our own annotations. We create our, we actually create our own ORM library to map LDAP to a database, things like that. We we wrote our own um, remoting remoting library to run on top of Joram middleware, right? To 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 ensure to guarantee message delivery. So these are some of the things we do, and and to me, uh, okay, good, it's good. We can almost do anything, right? And then we came to a crossroad at a certain point in time. Um, so I am actually more the business guy, okay? Chunon is he's, he's, he's a tech guy. So well, but we came to a point where we start, we hit some roadblocks, we hit some limitations with what we are doing. And we start considering whether there are alternatives and what are the risks and how do we want to mitigate them, okay? Um, <clears throat> So for me, the transitioning is not an easy thing because actually by this time, by then, I mean by then, we actually transitioned four times. We started off as Java Swing. We, our first product was built using Java Swing. I yeah, can't believe it, right? <laughs> <laughs> then quickly, not, not, not too long after, we went to RCP. Heard of RCP? Those who used Eclipse, Eclipse is RCP, right? Then from RCP, we went to first foray into web development, okay? And we use Wicked 
Java framework. Heard of Wicked? Okay, we started our web development with Wicked, right? And from Wicked, we finally settled down for Play. Okay, so each transition that we went through, I'm not a fan of it. Okay, I don't like it. There's a cost to be paid. Okay, but uh, every time we do it, we we gain something. We lose something, but we gain more. Okay, so that's our experience. So that that's our background. Actually, as a company, we we will uh, we will do that when we see the necessity to, right? Um, <clears throat> so, so what are the limitations that we uh, that brought us to this kind of decision point, right? <clears throat> Firstly, uh, we we have delivered on our projects. Our customers are happy with us. Okay, and when customers are happy with you, one of the things that happen is that they realize they can do more things. Okay, when you give them more, they realize they can think about, they can dream about more things. So things become the requirements become more and more complex. The customer expectation get raised, escalates, right? So we find ourselves having to uh, deal with more and more complex problems, and um, <clears throat> we don't want to shy away. We want to take them, take them on, and want to conquer them. Okay, to so us, we like these kind of challenges. But at the same time, we we, we found some limitation. Like for example, Hibernate. We are beginning to hit some performance issues with Hibernate. Uh, and then we find ourselves having to start working with some of the more complex annotations. And it's really not so easy to do, okay? Especially when things go wrong. Uh, and then we find ourselves having to do HKL, Hibernate Query Language. If you, some of you will do that. Uh, it is useful, but at the same time it has Downfalls, uh, short force, meaning the, the string literals that is not refactoring friendly, it's not type safe. Right? So sometimes we get some uh, gr griefs out of it. And don't, you don't really know how things exactly work in Hibernate. Right? So it's when things break, that's where you, sometimes that's where you are lost. Right? So these are the times that we lose productivity and we ask ourselves whether we can afford to continue doing the same thing. Right? Uh, and when we move to play one, um, Play One framework is actually a very nice framework. When you first use it, we really like it. Uh, but there are some other things, quirks with it, right? There are byte code manipulation, which is, if you come across it, uh, it breaks our codes, essentially. When you move from one version of Play to another, it basically breaks our code, okay? Uh, and then the run runtime Druvi template is also, is runtime, it's not exactly, it's not exactly type safe or so. So we also get some griefs from it. Okay, so these are some of the limitations because as our things get more complex, <coughs> uh, as, data, as the data volume increase, we get this more and more, hit into this problem more and more, and we realize that we need to um, really do something about it. But we need to ask ourselves, what about our investment in Java? Because we have done so many things in Java, right? We build, we build our own libraries. What do we do, what do, we do with it? Uh, what happened to our existing products? What happened to our customers? And really, what's the cost if we do it? If we take the leap, what's going to cost us, right? Um, <clears throat> more questions: How do we uh, how do we then migrate uh, from Java to Scala? What about database migration? Uh, we need to do parallel run, even if we want to build a system f f which is in Java. Now we want to have a Scala version. We need to run it in parallel. No customer is going to say totally stop this and run it on day one, right? How do we manage this parallel run environment? Uh, do we have the skill set? Actually, the is no. <laughs> no, we don't have the skill set. Because actually, when we make the decision at that point, we know we want to go there, but we don't know how to go there. And we have zero Scala knowledge. We have zero functional programming knowledge as a team. Right, so that's our background. Uh, but then the crux of the matter then is we still decided that we need to move because we cannot stay in that same place. It's really limiting us. And we feel that a small team we need. You see, my team is just like that. Just a few of us here. Yeah? Five of us, okay? Because Rudy left us, if not, we have six of us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we need higher productivity. We need better tooling, better way of developing higher quality and more complex software more effectively. I'll sum it up in this statement. Okay, so that's really what drove us to that. And uh, we, we also believe that our, our developers will enjoy doing it. Okay? Now, on hindsight, if you ask them, they will say, yes, they're not going back to Java. <laughs> okay? But during the process, mm -hmm. they, they, pull, they, pull, they pull their hair. So, so why Scala? So we look, look around for a while, and then we kind of like zoom in on Scala. 
Uh, why Scala? Uh, first, there, there are many, many good things about Scala. We just name a few that really matter to us. Number one is type safety, static typing. Uh, and number two is because it's, it integrates well with Java. We can still use back some of the important Java libraries that we have developed. Okay? Uh, and the language is very expressive. It's mi minimal to no bo boilerplating. I don't know whether you agree, but we find that largely true. Okay? Uh, and then what really blew our mind was the pattern matching and collection library. Okay, when I first saw it, it's kind of like unreal. Why well, can, you can actually do this with a language? That really drew us, first thing that drew us, all right? And then the, the other things would fall in place. Uh, literally, we do more with less. And when we do more with less, it means more maintainable. You are more productive. I think it's not, it's not, not an overstatement to say that 100 lines of Java can be written in 10 lines of Scala or less. If you do it well, if you do it properly, it can be done. Okay. But what's ugly? Uh, it's, it's new syntax. It's totally relearning the whole thing. Uh, it's a new programming paradigm. We've got to think differently. So we, we do have a pretty steep learning curve, but we learn together as a team. Okay? We learn together as a team. I started with Martin Odesky's. <laughs> what was that? Uh, huh? Coursera course, Martin Odesky, yes. Uh, Scala is a young community unlike Java, right? Java is very mature. Uh, it's also not backward binary compatible. So whenever there's a new version of Scala, you've got to recompile everything. There's poor ID support to start with. So a lot of things I'm talking about is what happened then, right? That was, our, that was what we see. Uh, right, compilation is really slow. Especially for uh, play two, is it? play two with tour, tour because you need to convert the template that we converted to Scala before it compile. So it's actually quite slow. Okay, uh, and there's no enum until Scala three. Still now, still no enum. Okay, so so that's a bad thing, but nevertheless we found that the pain we we are suffering probably is. The gain is probably worth the pain, okay, that we're going to go through to put behind and move forward. So we took the plunge, all right? And then our Scala journey begins, okay? So I asked uh, Chunon to, to kind of explain a little bit more. To take over from here. Okay. <coughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Okay, um, my name is Chun On, and uh, Sid was telling us that uh, just now we were in IBM in uh, Sun Microsystem. I didn't know he was in Sun, uh, IBM all along until I went to Sun Microsystems. So it's a big place in IBM. But let's talk about the Scala journey. And we actually have a lot of hesitation initially when we go into Scala. Because, but we need to find something different to, to survive. At the same time, so you, on one end, you basically say, no, this is not going to work for the future. You need to find a solution that allows you to grow forward as a company. So that something is needed. Well, we actually saw Scala back in the two eight days. It was just so crude, but the pattern matching is so attractive that you just keep them in your radar. You want to see the the the, the language itself, see whether give it enough time to grow to basically mature a little bit more before you jump, right? So we actually waited and then we actually saw it and we, after that, towards the end of 2.9RC2, we jump over. So there were actually some major challenges that really, you know, I, I, then, then none of us, none, no person in the uh, company can answer any of this question. How do you handle Hibernate? In Java, the top one, number one solution, ORM, is Hibernate. So you have to use it. And all of us are kind of brainwashed to use Hibernate because it is the ORM, you have to use it. So the next thing is that, can we avoid database migration? If let's say you can't avoid, you want to do database mig migration with a customer jump, number one, who's going to pay the buck? 
you know, for the migration itself. Somebody have to absorb this cost. And what if migration fails? What do you do? So there's a lot of risk, a lot of exposure. It was really either to go forward or stay behind and rot. That's it, right? And so we also need to think of if you are a customer, actually we, we share that with customer, they were a bit frightened. You mean you're going to a new language itself? What is it for us? You know, they will actually ask this simple question. So there's a lot of risk for them. And so we, anyway, we move forward then. And the first thing when we move forward, we actually encounter a new problem, immutability. It is totally a strange thing for Java, the imperative style developer. What is this immutability? How do you program with immutables? How do you do that? And that is actually one of the big, huge struggle that we have. And the next thing was, well, now they cannot mutate. I need to find somewhere to mutate. And then we try to figure out what's lenses, functional lenses, and not a study here. And guess what? Just to jump ahead, we find that these functional lenses, if you do programming, keep it simple, you can avoid them completely. All right. The next thing is that we need to know about design patterns. As these people talk about category theory, they talk about monoid, monad, and then after that, functors and all that. Wow, it's overwhelming. So how do you kind of like the, the, the learning curve is just simply too huge to, to, to clear. And what's worse is that Eclipse was just okay as an IDE, but debugging is a big problem, especially when you play, uh, we're using Play2 then. Uh, it takes actually 10 or 20 minutes to compile to get the code from core go up. So it takes a long time. And the next thing then, SBT was called Simple Build Tool. But everybody say that it's anything but simple. So that's actually another big struggle. You need to do that and, and learn about SBT. Well, we still like SBT, truth. The truth is we like SBT because it's better than Maven. Maven with the XML is almost, I mean, I, I can't figure out how to use Maven till today, but SBT, it is possible because it uses Scala as a language itself. So it's a lot easier. And the next thing is that we, as Sid mentioned just now, none of us know Scala. None of us know functional programming. And can you convince anyone or everyone to join you in this journey to learn a new language itself? Meanwhile, the company has to deliver. This is not a school. Everyone has to deliver to move forward, you know, uh, uh, get a business, and, and we need to do this. So lucky thing is that the team, we actually went uh, take up the Coursera class at the same time. We all sit in the office and learn about the, the, the thing and we do exercise together and all that. We form our own small little community. All right, so we, we learn. What would be nice is that we, of course, then I heard about Raymond, but I, it would be nice actually we actually get connected as a community to, to help each other to bootstrap. The thing that we actually, as we go on um, as a company, you find that we need to, actually when we go to Scala, we try so hard to find a solution for Hibernate as a replacement. We look at Slick, then was actually just started. We look for uh, uh, the norm. Actually, that time was in Play 1 and or Play 2. Yeah, we actually look for different, almost exhausted all the kind of persistent technology there are. But the question is that we need one particular thing is that how do you actually help us to transit from a Java solution in Hibernate to Scala at the same time with a parallel run. So that is actually a needed requirement. You cannot just tell customer, look, you just drop your old system, your old database, and then run the new Scala system with this new database technology, it just worked perfectly and it won't work. And customer will not be willing to take the risk at the same time. So we find that in the course of this journey, we need to tell ourselves, we need to think differently. We need to look at things from a different angle. That's, that's what needed. So the thing, first thing we understand was to build, to basically look at persist, persist, data per persistency differently. Uh, one of the things that we, that then we were in uh, uh, Sun Microsystem days, you know that we talk about Java EE, is the best technology around. But strange thing, when we started as a business ourselves, we never take on Java EE at all, because we think it won't scale. We, we actually stay with Pojo plain simple Java objects, but just selectively pick up all the enterprise technology. <coughs> so we start to also realize is that uh, we understand why Hibernate doesn't scale, because each time when you do a select of a 
when we talk about scalability, we talk about suddenly you have something like recently we have a project that take attendances for about for maximum of class size of 30, 40 people. They went to 100. Suddenly, a year or two later, they actually take a class size of 2,000 people. So how do you scale one shop, pull up 2,000 people? You won't scale the kind of size in Hibernate. Well, we know that we are going to the cloud. We need to have something that can scale all the way in terms of thousands, tens of thousands, within milliseconds, within microseconds even. So we need to have that kind of performance. So um, persistency in this case is that Hibernate, if you have a solution, it won't cut it. So we need to look at things differently. So we find that at the end, you know, one of the things that when you're in Hibernate, in the Java world, they say stay away from SQL. It's actually so hard to learn. But essentially, SQL is a functional language itself. You pay your time to understand it, and you learn it well, you will be rewarded completely. So that's actually one thing we do. <coughs> so we actually start to build a framework, a library, to actually, because we know how Hibernate works, we use our technology to talk straight to the database, and we actually know how to update certain attributes in the database so that it actually can have a system running in completely Java. At the same time, Scala, we actually will be able to synchronize with the system. We have achieved a parallel, parallel run. So that's what we did. And actually, because of, uh, since then, we actually have been, come, we came up with a library called SQL View. Because your whole design, your whole database is your whole data. But each time you're from the database, you're looking at different angle of it to pull out certain views out of it. And it makes sense. Let's assume that we have a, a user object. We know that all Java project has a user object. It tends to be very large. And you have a user object tend to have a lot of attributes inside. When you just do a selection, Hibernate will create proxies. You say it's very lightweight. But it won't scale to the thousands, to tens of thousands. And it won't even allow you to do streaming. Especially when you have to generate report, you need to stream out the data. If your data actually should go into half a million, a million record, it just wouldn't sustain the count load. So this is what we, if you do SQL, you are there. We think it's like, we, we really think that SQL is the right way to go, right? So what we did was that we built our own libraries. We find that one of the things that about different from Java and compared to Scala is that Scala tend to allow you to be a library builder yourself. Scala, Java makes it a lot harder to build libraries. You tend to look outside because it's so complex, you look outside for a library. But in Scala, because the language is very expressive, you can actually build your own library. So the first thing we did was to create a, a persistent layer to allow us to do the transition. And that's where the SQL view was born. We, before we went to SQL view, built our own library, we actually went around and looked for every solution. Initially, we were a bit naive, I would say, that before we take the plunge, we thought maybe it doesn't have it, we can build a Hibernate equivalent in Scala. So we actually attempted, because we actually did build a, 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 an annotation, a ORM to map against LDAP. We did in Java, and it works for us very well. So we said, well, maybe you can do that in, in Scala. We took three months, built on it, and we are new to the language, and we failed, actually. So we stopped. And a year later, when Scala 2.9 RC2 actually was ready, we took another plunge at it, we, we just move forward. But this time, we decided to look at database differently. We look from the database, not from the object design, ORM, but look from the database itself as data but you selectively pick up on the fly. If you can control your, your, your selection with a lot of precision, you can do almost anything. Nothing can stop you, actually. That's what we have done. So recently, one of my colleagues, actually, we were faced with a performance because it was a class that took attendance for about 30 to 40, and then suddenly 2,000 of attendance taking. And one of uh, the code was not designed to scale linearly because from you know, just it basically check out all the attendances to do the, uh, pull out all the attendees, 2,000 over to check a lot of things. I mean, two, three seconds taking attendance is a very long time. And it goes, it uh, become a lot slower. So what happened is that the team here, actually what they did is go there, analyze it, they know the bottleneck, go and optimize. Instead of doing some uh, binding that we do, some of reflection binding, we go native to do the call. Actually, we're using all native calls, by the way and immediately it dropped to a sub-second performance, even with two thousands of attendance taking. So if you know, you can actually know where to tap and get the performance exactly the way you want it, all right? Um, the next thing is that we were using Tor, we like Tor, but as you start to use Tor, we found that, well, 
you think they can do programming, I mean, uh, the, the play, you can use Scala syntax, it's very attractive. But once you start to do something complex, say, oops, you cannot do loops here, you must do this particular uh, style of programming, it's switch gear. We find that whenever you try to switch gear, it's very hard for developer, even for ourselves. We actually have this thing, if it's too hard for our, uh, ourselves, we, should, we think that it is equally hard for our developers. So we decided to say, we need to find a substitute. So we actually got a Scala tag and to replace tour. We have many, many projects then. And to change our templates from templates, HTML templates, to uh, Sc uh, Scala tag was a major effort. And do not ever attempt it to do it using IDEs. You won't cut it. You need to write scripts. In, we are using Linux. Convert it, do a scan, and then search and replace, search and replace. You need to write scripts to do all this. And we actually created a lot of effort and a lot of uh, bugs was introduced, but we actually minimized it and the team helped to work on it to stabilize the system and we do the transition. So that was actually another thing that we had went through, but it's a necessary evil. Since then, our production, our, our, uh, our what we call, um, compile time was from 15 to 20 minutes, go down to a few minutes. Huge performance. And at the same time, you can debug where you want it to, to, to stop. There's no, when a system, when you do delivery, you want to develop system, especially UI, you need to have something called traceability. That means if the code is there from this Java code, the controller, you jump to the page, you know exactly where the page is, the line of code. It is not being compared to another semi-form that you can't even trace where it was. So there's a bit of a bad thing. The next thing is that we have actually came up with the notification library, which is sending off SMS and email. We find that in the past we use all the open source library that comes as a framework. <clears throat> then when you want to do something, you want to do attachment, you can't do it. You want to say that, uh, can I have any response to say, I have uh, say 10 or n number of uh, 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 recipients, but if half of them is sent, I want to know who are the ones that I didn't send. Open source library can't give you that. So we took the plunge and we developed it. Rudy developed it. And then he actually found out, actually you can do, and we can very with precision to tell you who are the recipient did not receive the email, and who are the one that, and then we have one channel, such that you decide to send SMS or email. It's on the fly, it will decide what to do. All right. And it was time recently, because it was depending on ECA. Each time we do it, there's this version of ECA was falling behind. Play ECA is always ahead. And recent weeks, we decided to re-implement it ground up again, that we remove from ECA that it is all by itself now. It is just two, three classes we got it de developed. No magic, nothing. We just use plain old vanilla Scala code. Simple ones. Um, then the next thing is that we find that as you build uh, a web solution, you need to have very good access control. You notice that in all access control, they say, okay, this person is given this right, that person is given that right. Sounds easy, right? But we find that this is too simplistic. Because in the true web design system, we think that you need to have hierarchical access, role based uh, access. It means if the manager is on top, the manager will have access to all the subordinates. And likewise, the somewhere in the intermediate layer, whoever the node is, a parent node, will have all the access of the sub nodes. It's given. So this, this, you need to have this hierarchical access control. And we found there's none again. And what we do is to build one. And because of that, we actually find that we are able to control our destiny a lot better. When you know, we have to wait for different solutions. And if the author decided not to change because they have changed job or decided to switch to a more cooler language, you're done. You're, you, you're, you're stuck forever. So we learned a few big lessons is that do not depend on the, the libraries. And you find that they are not good enough or doesn't meet your needs, don't complain. Try to build it again, all right? The next thing we have actually is search engine. You know, all this uh, hierarchical access control, uh, search engine, the notification together with database access, it is important you have a very powerful persistent layer. It actually drives the, the rest of your applications, your, the rest of your technology. And with that settled, the rest is actually a lot easier. So now recently we actually, something that many years back, we wouldn't have think it's possible to build a graph library. And we also have done research. We actually try to use a, a Scala graph library, but I think you need to have a PhD in order to understand how the thing works. Um, it's just so hard. And 
we always believe that we are not in the same league. We can never build our graph library. We decided to take a step because we say that we need to have more control. We need to have a graph library to us to guide us to make more, more decisions on the fly. Allows us to do a lot more uh, because actually we're using graph to compute. Our SQL view that we talk about, it does auto-join auto on the fly. So you just specify the columns you want, it will do the auto-join. But it's not precise. But we've tested now with our new graph library. We built a new graph library ourselves. You can actually join with precision now because we actually create uh, our own graph libraries. It was hard. We went through four iterations to reach where we wanted. But the thing is that, do you want to focus? Because if you focus, get a library that's easy to use, our colleagues, the rest of the team, have an easier time. So the whole idea is to make it an easier environment for the rest of the team. So what did we use our graph library for? The team actually, you notice that our system actually access control and we have relationships built into our system. It's part of our solution. And because someone say, okay, this is the son of this, Bart is the son of uh, Homer, and uh, Lisa is the sibling of Bart and all that, if you have missing links with the graph library, we can auto-compute the missing links, the relationship on the fly for you. You can do this recovery of this relationship. And we actually have done that. The team actually have used the library and compute these missing links that we want. So it's actually interesting. Uh, we actually got it running in 2.13, but uh, also on 2.12, we went to win to 2.13, we move. And nice thing is that because our library has very little dependencies on the uh, third-party libraries, we can move forward quite easily. In fact, at this juncture, all our libraries already moved to Scala 2.13. All right. So with all this thing here, it actually allows us to build, it's like our lesson from Java, use Pojo, use something simple. And then after that, you find that you create better code. But we think that what is really missing is community. If you can actually share this thing with each other, you find that you can actually go, we can grow at the same time with the whole community. All right. So this is one of the things that we think we could. We actually had very hard times. Actually, it's not plain sailing. We actually like we move away from tour. If you actually go and say that you move away from tour, people say, "Are you crazy?" It's such a good templating technology. Uh, you need to have super powerful machines. You need to buy a uh, uh, IntelliJ Ultimate Edition, and that costs money, all right? And multiply by the number of users and all that, so that's quite a bit. And then the next thing is that in Java, we know that everybody uses Joda time because the Scala, uh, sorry, the Java library, the time library is broken. And so for the longest time, we use Joda time. Then suddenly, one version of our, the, the, we're using Scarlet JDBC as a powering underlying layer. The rest we built on top of it. So what we did was that we, uh, um, what call, one, one day actually they, we got a version. They say, well, they're not supporting Joda time anymore. But you can use an extension to put it in, but the core library does not support Joda time. Well, if you, it was a hard time. We say, bite the bullet, move forward without Joda time. Then we convert all our libraries to Java time. We build utilities and all that. One shot, we move out. Once you get over the chasm and that's it, you're done. You move forward. Don't want to think about the, the past. And then, of course, when we go to Java 2.13, there's a, a new problems. And then they have the, they deprecated the map values, the symbol, the stream. We use the symbol a lot because we use it to represent our permissions. So we can uh, annotate our permissions. So actually, now I say it's missing. Well, the good thing is that we think it's because it's that they're using the literal type. So you can make the, the, the string become a type, which is, I think is very powerful. So if you exploit it, I think we, we have a new way of exp expression. So the next thing is that, well, we want to be, to be fair. Java has the same problem. From we, we're actually using JavaScript internally as an extension of our system to make it more fluid. We actually write rule engines based on the, the JavaScript built in. We were using Anvil initially, then we used JavaScript. And because the time Nashhorn, they promised oh, all the good performance and good API, so we jump on board. On Java 8, we actually revamp, spend a lot of time uh, reworking, rework on it. Then when you go to Java 11, it's deprecated. Wow. But the thing is that no worries. Don't let this thing frighten you because deprecation is so take another three years. If you have enough community, they can be, probably revive Nashhorn one more time. So by then, there might be better technologies. So, 
So this is our journey. We actually started from 2012, knowing completely nothing. Then over seven years, we actually built on uh, what we call the 212X and all that, the longest time. We waited for a while to come up with 213 and all. It's actually a long, towering journey, but everything is rewarding. It is, all right? Uh, so far, we have been pushing forwards. Uh, uh, we able to do, do a lot of libraries ourselves, not that something we want to. We will only build library when we can't have it. We will build it. Given the first choice, look outside, look for the open source, see whether you have such libraries. Then after that, now we have Scala Tree. We just saw the, uh, the, uh, the announcement of Scala Tree, the features and all that. Are we going to go there? Well, you find that Scala Tree is actually part of the evolution. It is actually a new language. The question is that after we made so much ups and downs, are we going to embrace it? So we hesitate, we need to ask our question, what's in it for us? Can we still move forward? The answer is yes. It's just a language itself. First of all, we went to Scala because it helps us to protect our investment in Java. So Scala 3 will help us to protect our investment in Scala 2. You need to keep growing. And we think that we actually done quite well at this juncture and we, we are quite happy with that. All right. And let's talk about stack now. What we have developed, our own stack. We have actually developed the hierarchical role-based access control, which gives us a lot of control in our system. All right. We have SQL view, a persistent layer, and it has been there for about five years or so, and it is still working. Now, the one thing about SQL view is that it is specially tuned for MariaDB or MySQL. You know, sometimes you do open source, they want to open up for all the different type of, uh, uh, databases. Once you have different for different databases, you need to select the common denominator to support it. We are not there. We are not into that space. We need to create things for ourselves to use. So we focus on uh, MySQL, then jump to MariaDB because of Oracle licenses. licensing, we actually move to MariaDB. And now our database can actually use JSON objects, query JSON inside a database, query it back. And the next thing is that we say that we can do a lot more and we have all the performance we need. We can do clustering, everything with it. And recently, a couple of weeks back, we actually try, you know, because uh, we were a bit uh, stranded a bit, more or less, by Scala like JDBC because it was, we just need to use the low level JDBC layer, that's all. And we feel that, okay, because lack of knowledge, we then we decided to use it. I think that's the best option around. So a couple of weeks back, we decided to say, hey, with Scala 3 or Scala 213, maybe we have a bit more time to spare and let's explore the uh, JDBC drivers. Just like how we actually explore SQL. We think that we were completely rewarded because it is an easy language once you know functional programming and you, it's so easy to do joint. One of the things I, I just want to digress back again, when you do hibernate, the moment you annotate a class, you indirectly is hardwiring the entire design. But in SQL, we were talking using SQL, you can join any tables up to you. You decide when you want to do the join. It is possible to do any join that you want. So it gives you a lot of flexibility. So let's come back to the SQL view uh, we talk about. Um, the JDBC, we decided to try. We actually use, uh, we just use a regular uh, JDBC um, provided by Java. We access the database. We can pull 14,000 of rows, full record up into the memory within low millisecond, one or two millisecond. 14,000 rows. It's a huge performance. We were actually quite surprised. And saying that with this performance, you can do quite a fair bit of thing. 14,000 rows. Now, if you do just a subset of it, just do a pure select. Even not optimized, you actually have the kind of performance. If you do a sub-select, do a, using the indexes, we are, we are talking about the micro range. And it's incredible. And you can move data within the database itself without even ever reaching it back out into your system. So there's actually a new way of doing things. Um, we was... For some unknown reason, people start to say, hey, I have so many of your system. You know, how do I do single sign-on? So we write a, a what we call a, a pseudo single sign-on system, but we don't, we are not a security guy, we don't do that. But recently there was one, one company that says that asked us to, hey, you need to come up with a single sign-on solution. 
Then the other company that want us to develop tell us that, well, uh, you can actually use the open source library. There's a lot of OIDC libraries down there. You can use it, it's free. We know open source, so it's okay, we, we attempt to use it. But the libraries that we use in open source library, they were pure Java libraries, which is good for us. But we found that the way they implement is just too, too intense, too deep in. You can actually look at, we tend to like to look at problems simply. Look at the problems in, 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 a, uh, in a different line. Keep it simple, that's what we want. And we find that to use the library, they actually miss out the persistent layer. They miss out the app server. So you have the core library is completely useless. And it has a server side, you don't have the client side. OIDC has two parts, the client side and the, typically we use the client side to talk to Google or Facebook and all that. And, but however, in this case is that you need to build the server and the client side. We spent months, we developed it. And interestingly, we actually succeeded. Plain, simple Java. Scala, sorry. And we actually managed to develop in a couple of months, of three, four months, together with the team. And, and our partners actually use it for their single sign-on solution, just in time. And of course, the latest that we have built is actually in the uh, graph library. And we say with this graph library, we want to do different things. We can want to do uh, what we call uh, scheduling problem to overcome that. They give us a new way to actually execute our problem, to look at a problem, to do things differently. So this is what we are doing. Uh, the nice thing is that we use all these things in our products. So we can actually move from one app server to another app server quite easily, actually. So the whole idea is to reduce your dependencies on something. The more dependent you are, when they drop the bomb and you're done. All right, so that's how, uh, I think actually a better solution is to talk to people, the community, learn each other, learn from each other, and then after that, build the community and, and move forward. So we are actually planning for more talks. So today is purely a how we get there, the pains that went through, and also the rewards we got. Um, the next thing is that we actually have our other team members. They are going to share with you how they optimize the code, how they use, how they look at things differently, and uh, how they fight fire and all that. Um, so they are going to talk about that. So recently, we also have revamped a system that was previously using our car to do scheduling. So uh, for the longest time, we used it for the last five years, uh, using our car to do scheduling. Um, you, we try again to look for solutions out in the market to sell the open source. I can't find one. And we think it's a really a tough thing to do. Actually, always is in the mind. We actually built a new scheduling system within three Java Scala classes. And to use the, the what we call the executor service to schedule itself automatically. It will recover itself, right? So we actually done that within three Scala classes we developed it. The good thing now is that it actually can wrap on the UI on the app server, you can see the job when it was last run, when it was did it run on, on time, uh, how long it takes it to run. We have all these details inside now. You can run as many jobs as you want. You can stop the job in between and say that stop and, and not to run it and run it another day another time. So that's what we have done. So it gives us a lot of flexibility and it's so lightweight. Because you design something so lightweight, you know you have confidence that it will work. Because you have something that's so complex, when it's, when it's broken, you do not know where to go. And there's a hard time. So one last slide that we have. Um, if you like to work with cutting edge technology, bleeding edge te technology, come talk to us. My boss like to talk to you. Yes. All right. So that's all we have. And um, we like to s hear from you all actually at the same time and uh, let us know your pain also. But one thing we want to call out is that we should all come together to, to actually form. I think Java is like, Scala is actually a good language itself. It's not perfect but it gets you going. It, it allows you to have nicer design, uh, very effective code design. Yeah. So, so, so that's what's, uh, we actually have benefited a lot from it. And our team actually enjoyed doing the development. It's a hard time initially in the, develop, uh, the, the learning phase, but once you go beyond that, we also have some uh, in-house discussion, pushing the limits and all that. So we do that, all right? So we have... Any questions? <clears throat> Any?